If I'm thinking of a black cab driver, I think that it's going to be a, a person in his um, 40s or 50s, angry, and you know, a person who'd pick a fight with anyone and everyone on the road. Uber drivers, I would say, are generally immigrants, and that's relevant because they haven't got a knowledge of London. They can get rude to the customers and they know that you know, they, they would be able to get away with it. I know a cabbie who stopped his cab when the passenger started talking about Uber and asked the passenger to leave because he didn't want to talk about Uber. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't like, you know, judging a certain category, but when 99% of that particular category is the same, you just find it really hard to, uh, to keep your cool. So why did you decide to become a cab driver? Well, I was a police officer beforehand and it's a job where you're told what to do. You know, you accept it, you get used to it. But I wanted a job, firstly, which was part-time. And there are not many jobs which are part-time, which you, when you can, which enables you to work when you want. You know, I can pick and choose what I do, I can do nothing if I want. Yeah, the way I got into it was, um, I was in a full-time job in Croydon, and it was quite a bit of a trek from uh, East London all the way down to Croydon. So my um, my uncle gave me this idea, because he's been, he's been driving uh, as a taxi driver for about 20 years, and he's been driving for Uber for the past, past four years. So he gave me this idea is that if you get in a car anywhere, you may as well get a car that you can use with Uber as well. So every bit of gap that you can do, um, you know, on your way there, on your way back, you can do a few jobs as well, like an extra bit of cash. So it started off like a part-time thing. Um, and last, uh, last December, then December 2016, then I started working full-time. It took me about four years you have to study first. They called it the knowledge, yeah. knowledge of London, and um, it's no exaggeration. Personally, I, I found it. It takes over your life. You you think about it all the time. You wake up thinking about it. You go to bed thinking about it. You know, it's quite time cons consuming. Um, forward the highway. They left it the West Ferry Road. Uh, slip right into West Ferry Road. Um. Basically, you you learn 320 routes in London. Comply around about West Ferry Circus. For example, from Harrods to Buckingham Palace. Leave by I think it's left into West India Road. You think or you know? Uh, fall into West India Road. Forward into. You go and do it on your moped, and you have to learn the roads. North Cap, North, North Colonnade, was it? And full Cabot Square, and Cabot Square is facing. Fourth, yeah, <laughs> Fourth, <laughs> Cabot Square, forward North Colonnade, and it's on your right. On the right. Right, okay, you, 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 you won the day, you've got to say. But how would you get the Puddle Dock from Fetter Lane? Puddle Dock. Vita Lane. Um. And all the roads, all these routes, the 320, just give you a basic knowledge of London. So they right. go. So, so what would you do? Vita Lane, I'd leave by the Strand. Full strand. Street. It's, not, it's not in the Strand anyway. It's Fleet Street. There. Uh, Fleet Street. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Full Fleet Street. Yeah. Um, go on. 
full Fleet Street. The knowledge started in 1851, uh, around about a year after the great exhibition that took place on High Park, which was a building of greenhouses. And in that, in that time, people from across Europe came over to the great exhibition. When they left there, they got into the, got onto the Ansem cab and wanted to go to places probably like Bromley, Clapham, which were f further than what the uh, horse could go. So therefore the knowledge of the drivers in those days was basically non-existent. It was fairly local. Lots of complaints took place and the job was given to the Met Police to write out these 500 routes uh, as the crow flies across London. And that is where the knowledge of London started back in 1851. Yeah, I mean, I've studied for promotion when I was in the, when I was in the police before I was a cab driver, but that's only temporary and it takes a year, a year of your life. And that again, does take over your life but to a lesser extent, and you, you forget, I mean, any studying, like when you finish your degrees, it's a big deal at the time, but then within a year or two, you kind of forget how hard it was. But it was hard, and yeah, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, and yeah, so uh, you've got to have your uh, private hire license, get your criminal record check done. Um, once the whole process is done, uh, then you apply with Uber to be and obviously show them that your documents that you've already all uh, signed up as a private hire driver uh, and they've recently introduced the English test as well so you can't get away uh, with signing up with Uber without getting the um, English test done. So as soon as uh, Uber gives you the app you can start working straight away. I am something like 25% down on say five years ago working the same sort of hours you know, Transport for London issue far too many Uber licenses. They're issuing over 500 licenses a week, so it's going to saturate the market. T TFL, Transport for London, or as some of the cabbies say, totally failing London. of London has destroyed the roads. This is what we need to put in here. Start slagging off TFL, isn't it? They're bloody corrupt, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, no, they're definitely corrupt. And um, uh, you know, a lot of people believe that um, the guys at the top are bent, basically. Now, whether that's true or not, we don't know. But you know, when you follow some of the things that they're doing, it doesn't really make any sense because. London cabs is obviously um, uh, something that is um, seen that represents London because when you see films anywhere in the world, you see a black cab, you think of London, don't you? So uh, to actually try and get rid of some group that has been here for 360 years, which is the oldest cab trade in the world, there has to be some reason behind it. And most reasons behind anything is money. So somebody's gaining money from it. And, um, and you just got to ask yourself the question, once we've been destroyed, who are we being replaced with? It doesn't make any sense. You have these green huts, you've probably seen them, where you can go to have a meal. A lot of cabbies go in there to purely because it gives them some social interaction with other cabbies. If I'm doing a late shift, I will meet up with other cabby colleagues because it's just nice to have a break and speak to somebody. It's, it's pretty solitary what you do. 
Tourists, the here, well, look, <laughs> put them on, put the camera on There's them. There's two cameras. Oh, yeah. These ladies oh, are on holiday, they wanted to know what we are. This is our first day yeah. and this is our first tourist attraction. Oh, yeah. It's been very it's good. good. Yeah. It's been very good. 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 And the cab being a horse drawn cab. Yeah, horse drawn, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Because I came in a cab last night and my cab driver was very pleasant. Oh, I'm so pleased to hear that. Yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes you, do. you don't hear that, but I'm really pleased Thank you God had a nice film. cab driver. Could be a little bit of a pain, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, that's another story. <laughs> Have a great day. And you, darling. Have a nice day, ladies. Bye. Take care. To be quite honest, foreign people know more about us than Londoners. You know that. I suppose they all walk past and don't take any notice. But more, more foreign people know about us than Londoners. That's quite sad, really, because it's part of like. Community. Yeah, but if it's part of the community, you walk past the building every day and you don't know it's there. And so, how do you think Uber is as a company? <coughs> I think, um, for me personally, I think uh, they couldn't have been a better company than Uber because <clears throat> they're quite helpful in terms of, you know, um, whether you need to get in touch with the rider or you've had any issues with your fare or if someone left their things or their belongings in their car. So I think they're quite helpful and they'll come, try and come up with the best solution possible. Um, but I also believe that when um, when, when someone comes up with such a brilliant idea, everyone tries to put it down or tries to get the upper hand on it. So there's been a lot of drivers that haven't had, you know, decent experience, not because Uber's done anything wrong. It's just that they don't, they haven't understood that Uber's not employing them. Uber is just a, a source for them to get a job. Uber's business model has been dealt a major blow by a British employment tribunal. Responding to a case brought by two of its drivers with the backing of a trade union, the tribunal judges ruled the taxi app can no longer treat those drivers as self-employed. That would mean them having to pay the minimum wage and offer paid holidays. Uber plans to appeal. So I think those two particular individuals have the privileges now of having um, holiday pay and a certain you know, uh, benefits as uh, as an employed person would. But I think the rules have changed in terms of the hours they can work, and I don't think I would like that. So I hope that Uber uh, wins the overall case when they're appealing. Having been a police officer, I know that most people who go to court are guilty. You can put that in your film, but you can buy justice. The more money you've got, the more likely to, you are to get an acquittal and that's that's the way it works but they're not a nice company to work for I've got students that are coming into our trade because then there's not enough money in it now it speaks for itself if that's the case why would they want to go through all this trauma of doing the knowledge if it's that good at it these people that tell you that they're earning good money are telling you lies. There's no question of it. I can, there was, uh, just recently, it's, um, whether it was a bit of propaganda or not, I don't know, but it, it is factual. A guy, an Uber driver was sitting in his car, that, and this chap basically said that, so when I started three years ago with Uber, there were 14,000 track drivers on this, uh, on this system. Now there's 40,000. And every time we ask the question of TfL, TfL tell us it's, we can't do nothing. The government won't allow us to cap. So it's the government? It's the government, yeah. You know, they have to put them somewhere. They would rather them drive a minicab than have them, us pay for them on, the, on, on the, the dole, if you know what I mean. But believe it or not, a large percentage of them are doing both. They're only making up their, like, their money. That's all it is at the end of the day. The only reason they're still here and still cheap is because we haven't gone. Well, people don't seem to realise that once we've gone, the minute we walk out and shut up shop and turn, get rid of our cabs, watch what happens to the Uber cost charges. They will go through the roof.
if it's a Prius, you know, which is used by a lot of Uber drivers, 99% of the black cabs wouldn't give you away. And they'll get angry, they'll start beeping if you're like slightly slower. Uh, they're just frustrated and they just want to take it out on, on Uber drivers. I mean, if, if they're having issues, they should take it up to the actual Uber company, not target the drivers that are just there to earn their living. If that was a black cab driver, I would never get away. From what I've read, they did lobby um, David Cameron and George Osborne when they were in power. They've got money, and money gives you power, so... The bottom line is, most people won't boycott Uber because it's based on price. We're much more expensive, but they're even cheaper than minicabs. So while it's while they continue to be much cheaper, and they're so easily available, because it is convenient, people are going to use them. And most people don't adopt a moralistic standpoint. Maybe older people would, but I think younger people would just go on price. I read that Uber as a company aren't making a profit. They're so rich that they can afford to take the losses because they want to kill some of the competition. Gridlock from Trafalgar Square to Parliament. Thousands of London's black cab drivers block lanes in protest against the app-based car service Uber. Many traditional taxi drivers worldwide have had enough. From France to Indonesia and Mexico, they've been pressing their governments to take action. Back in London, the black cap protest is being cast not only as one to protect jobs, but also tradition. I'm a London, are you a London? Of course. So we're a London. That's the thing, you know, with the cab drive. It's quite unique in London that you come across cab drivers. We are actually born and brought up here. And, it, and that, I think that's a very, increasingly, it's going to be very rare. In 10 years' time, how many London cab drivers are actually going to be born here? In 20 years' time, I think the way things are going, if it keeps going like this, every single cab driver would just be fine. But that's why we're out of the European Union. Okay. Hopefully that will end because we've forced it to end. And that's one of the really, that's one of the few times that we've actually had a real vote, isn't it? To actually change things. Because most of the time our vote don't even count. Yeah. Um, I'm originally from uh, from Pakistan, but uh, I've grown up in Birmingham. Uh, so I did my uh, my primary school and high school uh, in Birmingham. Then I moved to London in 2008. So I've done my college and university here um, before before getting into Uber. So I'm not originally from London, but yeah, uh, I've been in London for almost uh, almost nine years now. I think, yeah, I quite like the, uh, the busy sort of environment. There's a lot of opportunities compared to Birmingham. I'm more of a crowded areas rather than uh, quiet places, so uh, I prefer if it's busier. I think I quite like uh, being here in London. You a lot of people that, you know, if, they, uh, if they're looking for an opportunity or, uh, or a future, they do, they do tend to move to London. Yeah, most of the people that, that, that are around here just practicing, they're all, well, most of them are Uber drivers. They so on days off, like so some of these kids that you see around here, they're with their Uber driver dads. So yeah, it gives them the flexibility uh, and time to spend with their kids as well, uh, the ones that have them, um, and at home. So I think it's, it works out good for everyone. I mean, I'm not ashamed to be a Londoner, but I feel that London has been so, is so diverse that it, it's lost its identity. I don't, don't mean it to sound awful, but it's just, 
I'm happy where I live and but one day I intend to move out of London so I think it that says a lot really. been a shelter keeper now for 13 years, so I was 11 years in Kensington and two years in Oxford. I don't know. About 15 different ones. Like that. It has changed, even about the amount of drivers that actually come in the shelters. Used to be having a lot, you know. I mean, there's five, ten people every day I miss. Sausage. Yes, please. Tea and the coffee. I mean, London has died since 2012, since after the Olympics. Business all changed, got quieter and quieter. But really, in the last two years, is. What do you think the reason for that is? Uber. That's what I think the reason is, sorry. I mean, I can't actually understand that before, where cab drivers all worked, they all brought their children up, had a good standard of living, no problem. Now, everybody who works for, or not everybody, a lot of people who now work for Uber are all claiming family tax credits. Why are we paying people to go to work? And then, all the old boys have gone now. I think that's because of the credit cards though. You know, they can't be bothered to do the equipment. But up to sort of Christmas time, you always saw these little old boys all work driving around. You don't see them anymore. I don't see them anymore. Because I don't know, I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't working here really, to be quite honest. I only imagine myself working here. I can't imagine going back into the real world because this is not the real world here. You know, we just, you know, it is real, but it's different. It began just like the attack on Westminster Bridge in April with a vehicle running over pedestrians. The London Bridge stabbings about whatever it was two months ago. Uber did their surging, which they do. Their price was six times their normal price and that to me is outrageous because they know that they can get away with it because people people are desperate to get away get home you know it really annoys me six times the fee so people are just you know they people have got no choice you know like I'd like to think that um, if I was working that night I wouldn't have taken the piss at all and if people were desperate just to get away, I wouldn't be charging them. I'd like to think that most cab drivers would do the same. And we do things like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm involved in a war, war veterans charity. I, I took to cab some, an old war vet to, to Normandy with a hundred other cab drivers for five days earlier this year and I'm doing other stuff. And there's a lot of charities which different cabs are involved in. So I think they do give a, a, a fair bit. When it comes to Uber, <clears throat> we've got to understand that Uber's there to make money, we're here to make money, so we've got to work with each other. Does it never ever feel a bit impersonal? Because I've heard there's like no direct phone number. No, if you've got any issues, you go to the app and like write a little report. It will get to Uber. Someone will pick that up uh, and they'll reply you within minutes um, of the issues that you, you know, you're having. So there's, on one hand where they haven't you know, given any phone numbers out, they have used the, tele, you know, the, the, the email system, which is much more quicker. You get some really lovely people who are so friendly and so nice and you can have a, such a good chat and you build such a rapport with them over 20 minutes you're with them 
sometimes they tell you about the most personal problems they've got and uh, and then you realize not all people are nasty or irritating or unfriendly it kind of restores your faith in human nature <laughs> Today, Uber launched the world's largest fleet of self-driving taxis, and these vehicles are now carrying passengers around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just like any other Uber would. The San Francisco-based company has outfitted more than a dozen Ford Fusion cars with lasers, cameras, and GPS sensors, so that they can sense the environment around them and drive safely through all kinds of conditions, including snow and bridges and crowded streets. In the back of the car is a screen that passengers can swipe to begin the trip, and it also displays exactly what the car is seeing in real time through its array of sensors. While these cars represent today's state-of-the-art technology, they are not free of humans just yet. At this point, I don't think anyone's taken it that seriously to be, able to, to be worried about the, uh, the driverless cars. Started a, a driverless cars um, in trial in Greenwich. Have they? Yeah, and they've uh, got them at Heathrow as well. Okay, I didn't know about that. <laughs> um, I, well, if 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 they started trials in in, in Greenwich and Heathrow, then I think um, it's much more it's much more closer than I realised. Um, I think, uh, well, very personally, I'm, I, I love driving. If even if it's not, if, even if that's not for Uber, it just you know, just generally like you know, going from one city to another. So if I wasn't able to drive, I think I would, you know, I would get worried in that sense. I joined the police when I was um, eighteen and a half which is the youngest you can join, and it was to the day, it was 18 and a half. Um, and to be honest, I was probably too young to join, but you don't know that at the time. I say that because of some of the things you come across and some of the things you have to deal with. But uh, I enjoyed it and I served for 32 years until um, 2012 when I retired. I miss the people. You have that bond. I don't miss the job so much because technology was moving on. In relation to technology, I was a bit of a, an old dinosaur. And that is the main issue. Techn I mean, technology has enabled Uber to become what it is. But if, for example, driverless cars, I'm skeptical about it, but people were um, cynical and skeptical about mobile phones you know 15 years ago probably and they've transformed everything we do are you going to have driverless cabs why would you need a cab driver really so that would worry me if I was a, a young cabbie looking for a career in the profession so yeah who knows what the future holds cut could be a could be a good ending for your film. <laughs>